to. I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work. Both of these are crucial to our success. And now I will turn things over to my colleague, Chela Weber, a senior program officer with the OCLC Research Library Partnership. And Chela will kick things off for us. Hi, everybody. Welcome. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I am uh, excited <laughs> for our webinar and our presenters today. Um, as a, a little bit of background, um, and those of you who have attended a webinar with us this year have heard a little bit of this before, um, OCLC has a long history of working in archives and special and distinctive collections um, because we know they're an import, they're, they are important to teaching, learning, and knowledge creation, and that they require a significant commitment to stewardship from our libraries. And then we also know that uni the unique nature of material and special co collections can make scaling this kind of work a challenge. And so we try to identify areas of common need and patterns um, of potential innovation to help libraries scale up their learning and expertise with these collections. In uh, October of 2017, we released our research and learning agenda for archive special and distinctive collections in research libraries. And it articulates um, sh some shared challenges and opportunities that we're facing in the sphere and suggests approaches for working on them together. And it continues to guide our work and our programming, um, including our webinar series. Uh, so access to collections was, was a key theme that ran throughout the agenda, uh, both about the challenges of providing access to our collections broadly and the challenges specific to new areas of inquiry and new research methodologies, um, like computational access. Uh, I used this pull quote from the, from the agenda because I think um, I think that it's, uh, it's important to think about how decisions throughout the stewardship process can serve to support or impede access. And, and a huge key to that is intentional practice in our legal agreements um, early in the process. Um, when we work in active and intentional practice to open up our collections early on in the process, or I, um, I think, pardon me. I think Creative Commons licenses, which our speakers will talk to us about today, are an exciting way to, to actively and intentionally um, work to open up our collections. I think they also can provide more nuanced ways to honor and support the wishes and rights of our collection donors. And then they can also help to try to anticipate and support future uses we can't identify yet, like the computational access needs that we're trying to contend with now and might be at odds with some of our older and more idiosyncratic uh, donor agreements. So um, I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, and um, so Heather Briston is the head of curators and collections uh, where she has responsibility to lead collection development activities as well as the UCLA University Archivist um, in UCLA Libraries Special Collections. Previously, she was the head of public services there. And she's also held positions at the University of Oregon and the UC Berkeley Environmental Design Archives. Heather received her MSI from University of Michigan, uh, a JD from Syrac Syracuse University focusing on intellectual property law, and a BA in international relations from Michigan State University. Um, she is a member and past chair of SAA's working group on intellectual property and the Secretary of the International Council on Archives section on Archives in University and Research Institutes. Uh, she's taught over 20 workshops for SAA focusing on legal issues in archives and is the author of Understanding Copyright Law in Trends in Archives Practice, Rights in the Digital Area, as well as several book chapters addressing legal issues in archival collections. Uh, Maureen Callahan is the steward of the Sophia Smith Collection of Women's History at Smith College, a repository that documents the ways the people have changed the world on behalf of women and other gender minorities. In her role, she manages long-term donor relationships and collects records of current work in women's movements. Maureen's previously worked in archival technologies and technical services at Yale University, NYU, and Princeton. She's a graduate of the University of Michigan and Bryn Mawr. 
Um, we're really lucky to have these two experts join us and speak today. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to them. Thank you so much, Shayla, and it's really wonderful to be here with everyone and have the opportunity to talk about this work that we can do to open up archives. So um, Heather and I know that we wanted to talk about the shared assumptions and values that lead us to think about um, acquiring Creative Commons licenses for archival materials. So we're going to be talking a bit about copyright use in all of our missions. And so I think that we're going to start with what I believe is common ground with all of us, which is that uh, we respect the law, um, we support our users, we want to make sure that they have what they need to make the greatest use of the materials that we collect for them. Um, we also believe that we have an important mission that needs to be um, sort of buttressed by these other ideas, archives and special collections libraries hold an important place in society, and so that we need tools to help us do that work. So briefly, what are these shared missions? Um, we want for researchers to be able to encounter histories that are important to them. Um, and we want them to then be able to use them and we want it to be easy. And so here you see an image um, from the Chicano Studies Research Center at UCLA that they've put up on Flickr. And I think that this is a really good example of the work that libraries and archives have been doing for a long time to get our work online, to get it to the web, to get it out to people, to make it sure that they can publish and republish. Um, these materials are collected so that they can be used. Um, but I don't think it's a surprise to anyone to know that often um, copyright law or our understandings of copyright law can get in the way of that. And I'd say that maybe sort of our edgy thesis statement of this webinar is that um, we all need some liberation from the current copyright regime. And we're going to be talking about sort of how we are unliberated and how that gets in our way and some things that we can do to address this. Thank you, Maureen. This is Heather. And so my job is to get us make, making sure we're all uh, started with talking a little bit about like, what is copyright for? And many of you will be familiar with this quote from the Constitution. And that is the thing that's important to remember about copyright law. It is federal law. It is based in the Constitution. And it was created originally to ensure that there is a right to benefit from intellectual production. It's there to stimulate creation. But it's also there to ensure that after a limited time, it is part of the public good. So when is something governed by copyright? Because this is really the first question that we should all be asking ourselves because not everything, lots of things, but not everything in our collection is governed by copyright. And many of you will uh, know the phrase, it is expression fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And that means that it's fixed. It's not just an idea. It's, um, it's also important to remember, and this is often uh, important to tell our donors, that copyright exists independently from the physical work that they may be donating to us. And oftentimes that can be a tricky moment for our donors. It's also important to remember that uh, our potential donors are receiving their copyrights that they want to donate to us, or they're donating them to us via a writing. Copyright can only be transferred in writing. It can be done um, via will, which is the most common reason. And, but it doesn't have to be specifically called out in the will. Some people will, oftentimes people who have um, use their copyrights during their lifetime, they will um, add that to their will. But all of us, all of us own copyrights. And when we pass away, we transfer it via a will or another writing. Now, this is the key thing, and this is our happy place. This is the things that are not covered by copyright. So, Based on my last slide, you, you can get the idea that ideas, processes, and devices, 
not covered because they're not uh, ideas aren't fixed yet. Um, wonderful things like uh, works of the U.S. government uh, created by employees as part of their official duties. Now, I've underlined this here because it is important to remember that for the copyright law, this is only works of the U.S. government. Um, we will see that in some cases, works created by, fed, uh, by state or local authorities actually may be covered by copyright law. So it's good to pay attention to that. Um, there's also materials that have expired as a part of uh, and fallen into the public domain that can be included there. And I also add this point right here for uh, slavish copies of 2D items, otherwise known as scans. Um, one of the things from this older case, at least in the Southern District of U New York, is that these materials are actually not. This is a fact of life. Copyright terms are very long. I don't need to tell that to an archivist. We all know how uh, frightfully long they can be, whether that is the life of the creator plus 70 years after their death, or if it is 120 years from creation for our anonymous or corporate author work. So those would also include works that are uh, referred to as works for hire. Yeah, so just as a way of illustrating this, so we all have an idea of how this feels, I want to talk about um, some materials that are in our own repository. Um, and this is a case study that I'm sure would, you know, something like it is familiar to every archivist who's listening. This is um, a membership certificate for Ellen Wright Garrison. Um, she was part of the Garrison family, which was an abolitionist family and a leftist family. She herself was a suffragist. And this is her membership card for the National American Women's Suffrage Association of the US. And it's this kind of cool thing because it's signed by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and Harriet Taylor Upton. Um, and you can see here that this was created in, on February 15th, 1900. And on this next slide, you sort of see in the background what's actually a family tree from the Garrison family. It starts with William Lloyd Garrison. You see here that Ellen Wright Garrison um, is in the second generation. And even if you go down this tree, it does not even cover all of the Garrisons that are alive today. You can see that a lot of time has passed in this family tree. And then when you think about the fact that um, Ellen Wright Garrison had this in the year 1900, and you sort of wonder, OK, well, maybe um, a researcher is here, and they're doing research on the Garrison family or on suffrage, and they want to reproduce this in a book, and they want to make, you know, they want to bring it out for the world to see because this is a pretty cool object. How would they be able to do that? Um, I don't know who the successor organization of the National American Women's Suffrage Association is. I don't know who I would tell them to go to to get permission. And if they just wanted to wait to see until this expires, that won't happen until next year because it's this um, 120 years for corporate entities since the point of creation. So we can see here that just kind of letting things go and hoping that copyright eventually expires um, has a chilling effect on scholarship. It makes it very difficult for us to meet this mission that we've been talking about of using and reusing materials that are important to us for scholarly and creative purposes. So a lot of what we're thinking about in this case, too, in what um, Maureen might be wanting to do with her certificate there is to think about fair use. And that is a topic that, as you can see with some of the articles listed here, that's a topic that we have been looking at a lot as archivists. And, and we are still coming to terms with the comfort of how to work with uh, materials that are under fair use. Technically, fair use is actually not an infringement. It is invoked as a defense when actions such as reproducing an item are questioned. You can, I think the easiest way for people to think about this is it's kind of like self-defense. Fair use is like self-defense for copyright infringement. 
And what fair use is there for, fair use understands that with some uses, while there is a little bit of owner harm for the uh, copyright owner, there is a large social benefit in the use being made. Next. So one of the ways that I encourage a lot of us to help to sort of navigate this idea of fair use and of um, finding ways that we can use our materials is to become familiar with these codes of best practices. Many people listening in today probably are familiar with at least some of these. For example, the ARL Code of Best Practices in Fair Use for Academic Research Libraries, if you're with an academic research library. But as you can see, there are several of them that would either appear, uh, apply to our collections or our users or, um, or our institutions. And I really encourage us to look at those because what they can help us do is to understand our work in a larger context. And it also allows us to see what other people in our same position are doing. So you're not thinking of these issues in a vacuum all by yourself. You are part of a larger conversation. And it allows us to find ways that we can assess the work that we're doing and assessing the risks with those materials. So this takes us to what we can do if we now know that leaving it on its own and hoping that copyright expires is going to take a long time. If we also know that Users are hesitant to make use of fair use. Um, some of those articles on that slide talked about some of the costs of um, scholars not making use of that. So what can we do as collectors of archival materials? Um, how can we help our creators understand our options? Um, and the way I like to think about this is that there's this collecting stream. And furthest downstream, maybe we can hope that people will take advantage of fair use if they're not quite sure what the copyright status is. But Heather and I are here to talk about the ways that you can go a little bit further upstream and make the situation easier for users. And that has to do with negotiating what we call open licenses at the point of acquisition. Um, this is giving the creator an option instead of keeping copyright or giving copyright away to license them in such a way that anyone can make use of that. And when that happens, then there's the opportunity for us as a repository to freely share those materials and for users to reuse the materials with quite a bit more confidence that they know that they're not um, harming anyone or infringing on anyone's copyright. So um, in my work at the Sophia Smith Collection of Women's History, I talk with people all the time who are interested in giving us historical materials. And we have sort of a suite of options that I talk them through that they can do when they're um, giving us title to the physical materials and then when they decide to um, make sense of what they want to do with their intellectual property. Um, technically speaking, if they did absolutely nothing, they would keep copyright. Um, like Heather mentioned before, just giving us the materials does not mean that they give away their intellectual property. Um, they own their intellectual properties just by the fact of the, that they had created those materials, um, that the, those are their ideas in a fixed form. Um, they also have the option to give copyright to us at Smith College or to a third party. They may decide that they have an heir or a business partner that I want to give copyright to. That is an option for them, certainly. Um, but then there, there comes these sort of two new ideas that we've been trying to make sense of. And these are by a group called Creative Commons. Um, and the first is to give copyright to the public domain via what's called a CC0 license. So what this would do is it would kind of, I guess, help us pretend that we're all in a time machine and we've gone forward to the future, to the period at which um, copyright had sort of expired. But instead, we're just making that happen right away. Um, it's, it's what they call a no rights reserved license. It means that um, because it belongs to nobody, it belongs to everybody. And that's, that's how I explain it. Um, Sometimes for creators, that, that's a really good option. I mean, something that is good to remember is that people are giving their materials to an archive because they want them to be used. They want them to be used for research. They want them to be used for creativity, and they want them to be reused. And I think in a lot of times, archival creators aren't quite aware of the ways that um, holding on to copyright can be an impediment to that. Um, 
but they might not be comfortable with this idea that anyone can use it for anything. And in that case, there's sometimes the option of what we call a Creative Commons attribution license. Um, and in that case, they're technically keeping copyright, but they're licensing it in such a way that anyone can use these materials to do anything they'd like, but the person who's reusing the materials has to attribute the creation of those materials to the donor, to the creator. They have to say, ah, yes, these are these, this set of photographs, and I'm using them in my book, and here is the photo and I am telling you who the photographer was. Um, and in my experience, that's, that's an option that gets at to sort of what the concerns or maybe even the emotional needs of the donor are, that the donor wants the, um, their history to be tracked. They want to be attributed as the creator of these materials. Finally, there's always the option to choose, um, I say any of these options, it's actually most any of these options, with a different option at the time of the creator's death or a future date. So they could say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and keep copyright. This is a way that I make my living. But, you know, once I'm dead, um, I, I don't need that income source anymore. And so I'm going to give this away with a Creative Commons Zero license. I'm going to give this to the public domain. It's important to remember here that once these Creative Commons licenses have been assigned, they can't be revoked. So if someone is giving away their copyrights with the CC Zero license, they can't go back on it, which is why it's really important to sort of have these conversations up front and make sure folks are clear on what they're giving away. Um, this is a chart that sort of take, lets you take a look at those Creative Commons licenses in a different way. Um, and so you see in the, um, in the columns there are these categories of what the user can do. Can they copy and publish the works? And with all of these Creative Commons licenses, they can. The materials may be used, reproduced, and published. Is there attribution required? That's that Creative Commons attribution license I was talking about. Can these be used for a, creative, for a commercial use? Donor, you know, you may want to negotiate that um, that uh, creators decide that, no, 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 these can't be used for commercial use. I, I'm totally fine with licensing my materials, but it can only be for scholarly uses. No one can make money off of it. Um, something to remember here, of course, is that you may want to you may want to think about what that means, of course, for as time goes by, if, you know, the cool Amazon show wants to use this, the creator is now dead, someone has to sort of, still the, create, the copyright holder has to manage that relationship in order to, to make sense of that. And um, that's just something for you to think about in the management of your repository. Um, can these materials then be modified and adapted? There's this non-derivation license that Creative Commons um, can be negotiated for. Again, you know, you might be really careful about negotiating for that because I think that in archives and special collections, most of what we want people to do is to take an image or take a text and modify or adapt it. Um, so again, you know, Creative Commons has a really, really good website. You can spend some time with this to figure out the licenses that are best for you. I tend to only really negotiate for the public domain license or the Creative Commons attribution license, but I think it's really useful to know that all of these options are available to you. Um, and, you know, I, so once you've done this, you've had this conversation with the creator and you want to talk about what's happening here, um, the next thing that you're going to want to do is to, again, put this in writing. Like Heather mentioned, um, copyright must be transferred in writing. That's the use that our deeds of gift or deeds of sale hold. Um, and so here is some sample language that we have at Smith College. We say that the donor indicates an express wish to retain full ownership, but they give us a non-exclusive right to authorize all of these materials for research, scholarly, or other purposes with this particular license. And again, it's really, really important to have a good, long conversation with the creator so that they understand what these terms mean and so that they understand what researchers will be doing with these materials. Um, similarly, if you're looking at a public domain license, um, here's some language that makes it clear that the donor is indicating this wish to transfer, convey, and assign to the public domain all intellectual property rights that they control in the materials. They're giving up intellectual property because nobody owns it, everybody owns it, and it's governed by this CC0 license. So, you know, we wanted to talk a little bit about how to have this conversation. And Heather, I, ho I hope you'll pop in here to talk about this too, because I know you've had a lot of good experience with this. In, in my experience, it's really important to, um, to sort of talk through 
all of the imagined scenarios that you can think about and that also the creator, the donor or seller might be concerned about when they're thinking about how will people use my stuff. This is part of what we do anyway when we're doing collection development, but this idea of mutual informed consent. I want them to really know what's going to happen in the archives, how someone might use their works, how particularly something that we talk about is someone they don't agree with might use their materials in order to make an argument that they don't agree with, to help them understand that this is just kind of part of being in the archives. Um, so I understand from, they understand from me everything that's going to happen there, and I understand from them what's important to them. Um, and I, I think that this is important because um, it's like we say in the bottom, <laughs> in the bottom bullet point, not mentioning it is not going to make this possible future conflict go away. These, um, if there is a concern there, it will probably come up sooner or later, and it's much better to have the conversation up front. I've also found that it's really important to say right up front, you know, the best case scenario for us is that we get dozens of people in every week who want to look at these materials, that they all make so many digitization requests that we end up putting this up on the web, that a lot of people use it, they reuse it, they remix it, they put it in their work, and, and that that's what we want. And I think it, you know, it's entirely possible that there may be some creators who say, oh, I had sort of thought about the archives as the place where things are just sort of quiet and safe, and I don't know how I feel about the idea of other people making so much use of it. And I think that's, again, good to talk about at the beginning. Heather, is there anything you would add to this? Um, I think you've covered it really nicely, Maureen, and I go on into more detail in the next slide. But I think what Maureen is saying here, and you can go on to the next slide, uh, is is that point um, that I think we do need to make with our donors because I think sometimes we can be very reluctant to talk to our donors about how much potential use and who might use their collections because we we don't want people to say no I don't want my papers to come to you but in the end in these kinds of issues, that might be a, a more appropriate conversation to have. So for example, I have only ever worked in public institutions. We have a public use mission. That means that anyone can come into our collections and use them for whatever reason they wish, so long as they don't hurt the materials. And sometimes, as Maureen says, people don't really understand what that could mean for the use of their collections. At the same time, if someone is intent on keeping copyright, I make sure that they understand the responsibilities of a copyright holder. Now, some people will understand this because they have exercised their rights throughout their lifetime. But for many people, they have, they have a, a vision of, you know, possible revenues that could come through. So part of, part of it is to help people understand about why they might want to keep it and realistically what kind of potential revenue there might be out there. Um, another thing that is hugely important for them to understand is their responsibilities. I mean, the responsibility of uh, quickly getting back to potential users and keeping their contact information up to date with you so that they can be contacted about using uh, materials. It's also important for them to understand that there may be tax implications for uh, retaining their copyright if they are wanting to have a tax deduction. So making sure that they are making an informed decision and have talked with their tax preparers. It's also really important for them to have articulated a posthumous plan for what to do for those 70 years after they return, if they retain copyright. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to talk about possible Creative Commons uses in that posthumous period because there is that very, very long tail. 
of copyright. Next. The other thing that is really important for all of, the, all of this is for those of us who work in institutions, or even if we have pro bono legal assistance, is to, when you're talking with uh, counsel, don't necessarily think about this as asking permission to do this. Talk about first about to articulate the risk assessments that you have made with your collection. You're recognizing that there may be copyright in, in the collections, but how you've gone about addressing that. Um, articulate how um, the use of copyrighted materials with Creative Commons licenses allows you to support your mission. A lot of times it's important to remember with counsel that as should come as no surprise, they don't understand a whole lot about libraries and archives. Most of the time they probably have never used an archive. So helping them understand what our mission is, is a really key part of us educating our counsel. It's also really important for us to remember that um, when you're in law school, you are actually not required to take any courses on copyright or intellectual property. That, that's, that's an elective. So many times we do need to educate our counsel about the issues involved with our collections and how it is we have found a way to navigate them. And then that is when you can lay out your argument for why you are selecting particular Creative Commons licenses for making materials that the repository might hold the copyright for, or in how you're reaching out to your donors with those licenses. Great. So, OK, now we are at the part where we are talking with a creator about bringing in really cool stuff into the repository. We have convinced them that assigning a Creative Commons license is the right thing to do. We've put that in the deed of gift or deed of sale. We've talked with our counsel about it. And now it's time to describe it and give the good news to our researchers. So how do these licenses fit into our descriptive programs and my answer would be it's pretty much exactly the same as before. Um, if you describe in finding aids using DAX, this is explained in the conditions governing reproduction and use element. That's DAX 4.4. It's nested in that EAD use restrict note. If you're writing some MARC records, that's going to be in the 540. In any case, in the same place where you would say who the copyright holder is, you can explain what the copyright license is. Um, and so, you know, the principles behind this is that, um, as with any other reproduction and use note, is that we want to be really strong and really clear. We want to give our users this permission slip so that they know they can go forth and make the best and highest use of this. Um, if the donor has assigned a CC0 license, let's go ahead and explain that they've re relinquished all of that copyright um, so that the researcher understands that this is a copyright-free item and that she can do anything she pleases with any of the materials under this license. Um, those other Creative Commons licenses that I showed you in that chart um, sort of have other stipulation. Go ahead and use the clearest English language sentences that you can to explain what those are. Let's not be mysterious. Let's make it really, really, really clear. So um, I'd like to show you some language from our finding aids at Smith College. So this is um, a uh, conditions governing use note for an oral history. And it explains that to whatever extent that she owns copyright, um, that's always a really important caveat, Ellen Chesler, the creator, has de dedicated copyright in this oral history to the public domain. Here's the Creative Commons license that it's governed un under. And then we have this really nice thing at the end of our notes that um, others may decide to adopt. Actually, I think we might have even borrowed this from Princeton, which is that researchers do not need anything further from Smith College Special Collections to move forward with the use of this oral history. That's, you know, that's the best blessing that we can give. Um, here's one for something that was licensed with a Creative Commons attribution license. And this is for um, an archival collection from a grassroots activist group. So to the extent that they own copyright, the creators of these records have licensed the material to be 
freely used so long as the user attributes materials original authorship to the organization. I feel like if I were a reader reading that, I'd be like, okay, I feel like I can do that. We then tell them what the license is that it's governed under. Um, and then we explain sort of the tricky part about archival materials, because we all know that in, we collect, in what we collect, we collect materials that are authored by the collector or the creator, and then we also bring in materials that they just had, you know, that they held on to. That exists in every single archival collection probably. So we explain that for instances um, that copyright in other items in this collection may be held by their respective creators. Um, and that for instances which may regard materials in the collection not created by them, researchers are responsible for determining who may hold those materials copyrights and obtaining approval from them. And so here we're just really trying to make this distinction that these licenses govern materials for which the creator owns intellectual property, but of course that's not everything in an archival collection. Um, and so now Heather is going to talk about, you know, we've we've done this great work, we've brought in these materials, we've talked with council, we have the deed of gift, it's in our finding aids. What now happens in our repositories now that we have these Creative Commons licenses? Yeah, so this is part of public services and supporting use and our mission. So one of the things that I think that is really great about Creative Commons licenses is that it allows us to encourage the use of collections widely in both research and teaching. Uh, one of the key things that I think when you're adopting Creative Commons licenses is making sure that everyone, whether it is frontline staff on the reference desk, whether it is curators and other staff that do instruction, make sure everyone is empowered and is trained to be able to talk about what a Creative Commons license is. Uh, one of the things that I have found a lot in doing public services is that don't worry if your users are asking about, um, even though you say you've got a nice little Creative Commons license on your online item, and they're saying like, well, what about the permissions? What do I need to do? Don't worry if they're still skeptical about it and if they need more assurances. So you can make sure that, um, and that everyone is prepared to talk about Creative Commons licenses. And, and in the end, everyone does come away happy because they're just so amazed that materials are widely available. And so what I've shown here are, I'm going to show you two examples of collections that are online right now from UCLA. One of them is our Los Angeles Times Photographic Archives, for which the UC Regents do own the copyright, and we have made them available with a CC BY license. So this requires a attrib attribution, but it can be used in any way. Then there's this collection, which is the UCLA Historic Photographs Collection. And um, as you can see with this, this one is slightly different. This one is, uh, requires attribution and non-commercial use because um, for university items and university images, they are often also impacted by trademark. So in this case, we want to make sure that people do have to come and talk to us about the non-commercial uses. So we always want to leave people with some things that you could do right after you uh, sign off from this webinar. So first thing that we uh, want you to be able to do is look at this and find out what are some recent acquisitions? Uh, review how you framed your conver uh, conversations about copyright and use. Another key thing is to look at your boilerplate in all of your agreements. And what would it take to add some Creative Commons language in there? At your ne next staff meeting, make sure everyone is comfortable and knowledgeable about uh, explaining copyright and Creative Commons to researchers. This is a great opportunity for role play. We, we don't do enough role play, and I think this is one of the ways that the more we talk about it, the more comfortable we'll get. 
And then finally, look at your duplication and permissions forms. Is the language in them up to date? So um, thank you so much for listening to us talk about this. We are really eager to hear what your questions are and to hear about maybe even any plans that you have for negotiating Creative Commons licenses. Um, thank you so much, Heather and Maureen. This was terrific. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in via chat, and I'll go ahead and read those so that they're on the recording, um, and then you guys can jump in with some answers. Um, how long is the Creative Commons attribution license? Death of donor? When donor dies, does it belong to the public domain? So, um, Heather, you're the real lawyer. <laughs> you only <laughs> pretend to be one as an archivist. My understanding is that since this is a license, um, it's licensed for as long as they have the copyright. So it would be at the end of the copyright term that it would go to the public domain. Is that right? Yes, you are correct. So, um, so unless someone uses a CC0, um, uh, unless someone is using a CC0 um, license, it's, they still, they're just retaining copyright. You always have to think of copyright licenses are temporary gifts. And so temporary gifts, you're giving specific things for a specific period of time to specific people. So in this case, it is the rights are given to the repository, but they continue for as long as copyright does. So, uh, so that's why uh, with all of these other things, once somebody dies, it's still going to go on unless they actively dedicate it to the public domain from the beginning or if in that negotiation where they decide, all right, I'm doing one thing while I'm alive and then one thing after I die, if after they die, they say, then I want it to go to the public domain, then that does need to be articulated, but that would be the only way it would end. Great, thank you. Um, and another question, um, what do you recommend? Copyright transfer to the archive or even to the archive or to the public domain via CC0? If we work for a public institution and copyright is transferred to us, it's essentially in the public domain. Thoughts? Well, I don't know that it is essentially in the public domain if copyright is given to um, a public institution. It's not. not. No. <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> We're copyright owners then. Um, so, so yes. So that it's that that is not an equivalent because. Because what it then means is that our institutions need to make sure that, and our institutions may want to have very specific ways that it exercises its copyright. So institutions do exercise copyright, and in many cases it would depend on the mission of your institution. It would it would depend on the mission of your group, but. If you want to put it in the public domain, you have to put it in the public domain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, and I would um, really recommend. There's a great series of articles by Jean Dryden that talks about the ways that um, archivists leverage copyright to sort of promote other desires that they have. And I, I think it's just kind of a good reminder to us that um, as much as we as archivists think of ourselves as people who sort of just let it out there and let it be, there are lots of cases where archivists use copyright to prevent materials from being used. And so if you really want to future proof this, if you want to make sure that this is totally open in the future, the best way to do that is to convince the creator to put it in the public domain. Absolutely, yes, because sometimes we have a tendency to want to use permissions as a way of making sure that we are being credited appropriately, which, you know, I, I will say you can, even when we've licensed things, people have um, accredited, you know, they put in odd credit lines. So <laughs> the thing is, is to be very certain what it is your end goals and your mission is. And, and the reasons behind the choices that you're making and the uh, 
um, and the advice that you are giving your donors and your researchers. Uh, I think another uh, factor in in talking about this in your institution, if if you perhaps want to have C conversations about CC0 with donors, but you're getting some institutional pushback uh, because they, the institution is used to having copyright transferred to them, is a discussion about the time and effort required for managing permissions. Um, yeah. Oh, that's an excellent point. That and and that's oftentimes a point that. Um, I try and explain to people because managing copyrights takes a lot of time and it is not cheap because it requires a human being to do that. And, um, you know, you, so you are paying somebody to do that work to create those licenses. So it, it's, it's, again, it is a very important consideration that needs to be balanced by your mission, it needs to be balanced by the use. Um, there, uh, one of the things that we look at a lot here at UCLA is what, who's making the use and what kind of use are they making? And um, to what extent do we want to, um, do we want to put um, additional steps in front of that? So it's one of those things that is a choice that should be thought through very far. Great. Um, uh, our next question from Maggie. Uh, Maureen, um, could you describe what affirming copyright in your deeds and agreements looks like? Yeah. So. In the same place where we give folks a lot of options, including, okay, I want to dedicate this to the public domain, or I want to put in attribution license to this, or I want to give copyright to the third party, we also have a place in our deed of gift. And I, I think this is probably pretty common where people say, yes, I affirm that I am going to keep copyright to my materials. Um, and below that, we also have a little form of like, and here's how you can get in touch with me when someone wants permission wants permission to um, use things that are under copyright. Um, and the reason for that is because if they hold copyright, we, we really need to be able to help researchers get access to them so that they can get that permission going. So it's, it's just a place in the deed of gift where it says, yes, I am the creator of this and I am keeping my copyright. But like I mentioned before, um, the creator holds copyright unless they give it up. So even if we didn't have that part of our deed of gift or our sale agreement where they affirmed it, they would still hold that copyright. And, and to add to that, it's also very important in those cases because actually here at UCLA, we have, we have multiple deed forms. And one of our forms is a situation where the donor is affirming that they own the physical material but they don't own the copyright in it, which, which can all, often happen when it's someone who has collected materials, so they are not the original creator, or they um, were not given the copyright when they were given the material by the creator. So in this case, we also use a deed, but you can also use this language in your own deeds in situations where you've got a donor who owns the stuff, but they do not own the copyright. Okay, and our next question is from William Brown. Um, he asks, is, is there a conflict in using Creative Commons attribution license with state public records law? That is such a good Heather question. <laughs> oh, I see how you are more. <laughs> no, I, actually, Bill, that is an excellent question. But in, in this case, um, it, de it will depend on whether or not, uh, it, it depends on first on the, uh, the laws in your particular state because there are some materials and some states that retain copyright in their materials. So, so you may not, you may have less of a choice there. So it, it, that is based on state law, so it varies from state to state. But in, in regards to public records acts, public records acts has to do with access to the material. So you can provide access to anything, 
uh, or not, you know, based on your state's public records law. So that defines access. Ownership of the underlying copyright is a different question. And, and this, is, this is the same for uh, materials, whether they are public, would fall under a public records law or not. Always remember that providing access to something and um, allowing uses beyond accessing material are two completely separate things. And some of us may have collections where researchers are allowed to look at materials, but they are not allowed to get any copies of materials. And so that, that is an example of that um, separation. So for in many cases, there would not be a conflict there, but it has to do, it, it has less to do with public records law, and it has um, everything to do with how uh, state records and state uh, documents, uh, the copyright for them in your particular state. Thanks, Heather. Um, the next question is from Rachel Matson at the Treader Collection in GLBT Studies at the University of Minnesota. Um, Rachel says, we're considering using CC licenses for our trans oral history project. But if I understand correctly, CC licenses are unrevocable. We are using a layered consent process where we get consent several times over the course of years, and we're concerned that participants would be unable to change their consent if, this, if their circumstances or sense of risk changed in the future. Can you speak to this? Yeah, you know, Rachel, this is exactly the kind of question that comes up for us quite a lot. Um, and I think that this speaks to a little bit of what Heather was saying before about that distinction between access and use, right? Understanding that what a person is able to do in terms of making copies and reproducing those copies and publishing them is different than whether they're actually able to access this in the archives in the first place. It's entirely possible to um, get a CC0, no rights reserved public domain declaration for materials that aren't allowed to be accessed for 30 years, right? Um, that Those are two separate negotiations that you're having with your creators. Um, and, I, and I think that it's, it's good to remember that this sort of copyright question that we're having is a legal question about how people can, you know, you know copyright law is really about who can make money off of this work, like who can reproduce it um, and, and make use of it versus who can access this in the archives. And so I, I in at Smith College, we, we do really try to manage these separately, that we talk about like, okay, what are the privacy considerations? What are the ethical considerations? When should these materials be able to be seen? Um, and those can be changed over and over time, like you're talking about this sort of, um, I think you called it a layered um, consent regime, which is a really interesting idea that I hope you write about or do your own webinar about. Um, you, you can absolutely do that and sort of change the access restrictions over time, and that's different from um, this copyright question of who can reproduce it. That's an, that's an excellent point, Maureen, and I think that also gets at one of the questions that I see quite a bit when, because uh, all those uh, workshops I used to teach for SAA, I taught both the copyright workshops and the privacy workshops. And one of the things that happens quite a bit is a sort of a, a blending of copyright and uh, privacy, which actually they are, they are two separate regimes. And oftentimes when we're talking with donors, many times their concerns are actually more about privacy than they are about copyright and making sure that they're not using copyright law to address what is really a privacy and confidentiality issue. Yes. <laughs> and, and we as archivists need to be very attuned to that and make sure that we aren't using a copyright solution to address a privacy and confidentiality question. Yeah, and I think something I would add to that is something we talk about a lot is that visibility and privacy are sort of two sides of the same coin. And so if someone 
does give their consent, that they do want these materials accessible, and they also say that they want it to be reproduced, we want to make sure that they get that visibility, that again, we remove all of those barriers so that a researcher can use that oral history, reuse it, put it in a documentary, do, do the things that they want to do. We want to make sure that, um, that that sort of copyright regime is in line with our sort of core mission of if something, if, if, if we and the donor have determined that material should be accessible for research, let's make it really accessible for researcher research and let's make sure that, that those sort of copyright tools are in alignment with what that mission is. Great. We've got two more questions. I'm going to try to get them in here under the wire. Um, Bridget uh, Kampler says that um, at GW they're interested to hear more about the tax implications of a donor retaining rights. Oh, well, that is uh, that's an important thing to consider, and and this is really important to talk with your um, external affairs or gifts people there at George Washington. Because one thing to consider is that um, sometimes donors are not able to get the full tax write-off for materials if they give you a um, if they uh, if they give you something um, only only part of the rights. So so basically, if they give you the material and not the copyright, they're actually retaining a part of that gift. So in many cases, the IRS would not consider it a full gift in kind. It's going to depend on the donor, and that's why I always tell people they really do need to talk with their tax preparers about the implications of their gifts and any um, retention that they may have. But that is something to consider as far as both the, the value of their copyrights and whether or not it is going to be a, considered a full gift in kind by the IRS or not. I'm not a tax preparer, so that is usually one of those things. And that can be a difficult conversation to have with donors because they don't always understand those implications, but I really try and hammer that home with our donors that, no, you really need to talk about the um, tax implications if you're only going to, uh, if you're going to retain your copyright. And the, our last question here says, which resource does the researcher look up? used to look up a Creative Commons license to confirm the license existence? Oh, um, so my, my understanding of that question is how, how does a researcher know that materials are covered under a particular license? Well, at least that's the question I, I think that is and that I'm going to answer. And I think that goes back to um, the part of the presentation that's about archival description, that um, if materials are covered under a license, it's really important for us to explain in our archival description which parts of the materials are covered by that license, what that license means, and what a researcher can do with them. And then if there are questions about Creative Commons licenses in general, again, Creative Commons has a really great website, and I would recommend looking that up. There is no registry of who ha 